everyone, or good evening to Dr. Wright. Um, we are uh, we're honored to be joined by three phenomenal scholars for our conversation about the philosophy of Rabbi Dr. Lord Rabbi Dr. Jonathan Sachs. Um, he, he was a larger than life figure, not only for British Jewry where he served as chief rabbi, but for uh, world, modern, world Jewry at large and world modern Orthodox Jewry specifically. Um, where he was, uh, you know, a, a tremendous thought leader for many of our many of our congregants. Um, for many of us rabbis, he was mainly a competitor to our sermons, with his books being pulled out when our sermon was to begin. But uh, he also, besi besides for that, was a tremendously deep thinker, and uh, uh, his his passing is a loss to our community. We're joined this afternoon by three scholars who are students of Rabbi Sachs. Dr. Erica Brown is the director of the Mayberg Center for Jewish Education and Leadership and an associate professor of curriculum and pedagogy at George Washington University. Dr. Brown was a Jerusalem fellow, is a faculty member of the Wexner Foundation, an Avichai fellow, and the recipient of the, of the 2009 Covenant Award for her work in education. Also joining us is Dr. Daniel Reinhold, Dean of the Bernard Revel Graduate School of Jewish Studies and Professor of Jewish Philosophy. Educated at the universities of Cambridge and London, he had previously been a professor of Judaism at the Department of Theology and Religious Studies at King's College, London. And Dr. Tamara Wright, who is the Curriculum Development Advisor at Faith and Leadership and, uh, and Visiting Research Fellow at St. Bennett's Hall, University of Oxford. She holds the a Senior Research Fellowship at the London School of Jewish Studies. A specialist in contemporary Jewish thought, she is the author of The Twilight of Jewish Philosophy, Emmanuel, Levin, uh, Emmanuel Levinas's Ethical Hermeneutics, and has published articles on Buber, Rosenzweig, Levinas, and post-Holocaust Jewish thought. She also co-edited Radical Responsibility, um, celebrating the thought of Chief Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs and face-to-face -face with animals, Levinas, and the animal question. Um, this afternoon, we'll divide our conversation into two segments. In the first segment, our panelists are going to discuss Rabbi Sachs's methodologies, the way he prepared, the way he taught, and how he acted as a rabbi. And following that, we'll have an opportunity to hear from all three panelists about areas of Rabbi Sachs's philosophy that they found particularly meaningful for them. Um, Dr. Brown, Let's start with you. I know you had a lot of interesting thoughts about Rabbi Sachs as a teacher and as a pedagogue. Um, thank you. And thank you so much for organizing this panel. It's really a pleasure to be with distinguished colleagues and to think about someone whose influence on my own life was outsized. Um, I uh, met Rabbi Sachs for the first time in 1988 when I moved to London. My husband was a medical student in London. I did not know how to drive, and we lived a half a block from Jews College. So I spent a lot of time in Jews College simply because it was a place that I could walk to, but also because I met Rabbi Sachs, and uh, sitting in his classes was an experience many outstanding um, instructors in my gap year in Israel, there was something about him that put many, many of the worlds that I was interested in together as an undergraduate in philosophy and Jewish studies. Here was someone, uh, a gallant teacher um, and, and, and um, uh, a methodical uh, preparer, someone who every class was an, an artful composition. Um, and I had the opportunity to have him as a thesis advisor in Jews College and also to teach in his synagogue in Marble Arch on many occasions. So I got a front row into seeing him as a teacher, as a, as a pulpit rabbi, and as someone who was, um, was in lead for to become chief rabbi after chief rabbi Emmanuel Jacobitz. So listening to his lectures and, um, and thinking about, and, and visiting him in his garden shed in Golders Green, the shed behind his house where he did his work. Um, and I, I, I wanna frame, I, the three words that I wanna introduce in thinking ab about his output, and that is relentless spiritual ambition. And I think it just set him apart from so many other thinkers who perhaps had just as much content 
and maybe even more background because Rabbi Sachs was first to admit that his Jewish education wasn't perhaps as, as strong that he had had pursued this uh, slightly later in his life and didn't get the benefit of the same type of Jewish day school education that many American rabbis benefit from. And yet there was something relentless about his contempt of knowledge, his being on trend on major issues of the day um, in discussion with his brother, Alan, after Rabbi Sachs passed, Alan said that Rabbi Sachs read one book a day, right? One book a day. And I have to say that although the, the other uh, colleagues here with me have, uh, have had a longer history of studying and learning with and from Rabbi Sachs, for me, Rabbi Sachs was uh, very important at a very critical time in my own career development. And so I watched how he prepared. I read, I tried to read some of what he read. I saw the piles of books on his desk. Um, I talked with him about the sort of trance he would go in in the summer where every other obligation and responsibility would go to the side so that he could write his book. Um, in fact, I have this bootlegged copy. I know some people have bootlegged Bob Dylan, but I have a bootlegged um, Rabbi Sachs. This is, um, I think, his first book. It's Traditional Alternatives. I don't know if, Tamara, you have a copy of this. Um, this actually came into the registrar's office when I was in Jews College. There was a problem with the cover, so they sent all of these back, but the registrar gave me one. Um, and, um, and in this book, he, on page four and five, he asks about 16 very profound questions. This book was written in advance of a conference called Traditional Alternatives. I don't know how many rabbis would say, I'm going, I'm organizing a conference let me write a book about it. Um, and before I get to the questions, um, this book was written in response to his brother Alan's question whether or not he should go into law. His younger brother was um, was thinking about what he should do with his life and knew that his brother was, uh, his older brother was a successful rabbi. Would it be in some way a, a, a betrayal of Jewish values to go into law? And instead of giving, as Alan put it, instead of giving me a response, my brother wrote me a book, To Heal a Fractured World. Um, so that was just, again, when we're talking about sort of relentless spiritual ambition, the idea of, of seeing trends and responding to them. And I think many of these trends he identifies in the, his first book that would become themes that he would write about for uh, for for uh, for his you know throughout his career, he wanted to know the relationship between the Jewish people and humanity as a whole. He wanted to think about universalism and particularism and how far Jews should go in the diaspora to be involved in the moral and social issues of their wider society. So I would say that on some level, he put himself in the position to negotiate some of those uh, tensions and concerns. Um, my, you know, the last thing I'll say is that in, in my own experience, I've met rabbis who are pastoral, their strength is pastoral, that met rabbis whose strength is, is in teaching um, and, and rabbis whose strength is in scholarship. Um, I think Rabbi Sachs's great strength, if I could, if I could say this, um, you know, is that he was a thinker on the global stage. Um, and although I would never call him an influencer because I think he'd say that is so American and arrogant, I think in many ways that is really what he saw Judaism's capacity to answer world questions and world problems of the day. And that his job was to distill Jewish scholarship um, into digestible responses to demographic studies, to philosophical conundrums. And he did it by making the audience feel smart not by making the audience, you know, he, he, he raised his audience up by introducing them to a cast of characters in Western thought and, and, and with the distillation that people could absorb, but also with a beautiful lightness, um, with humor and, um, and with kindness and uh, with elegance. And so, I, I, you know, in some way um, that those things were things I thought about in, a great deal as a student of his and how that would apply, how, how I could apply perhaps 
a fraction of that in my own uh, in my own career. I, I, I'll just say as a, as a closing point, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about an answer to one of the questions that I raised later in the program. I, um, you know, I uh, I've had many opportunities, as have my colleagues, to teach about Rabbi Sachs and what we've learned from him. Um, I can only say that uh, I, I that, that that almost every occasion has brought me to tears really understanding what the loss of a Rebbe is in um, in one's life. And I, I, I believe that this relentless pursuit of, 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 uh, of spiritual ambition, the spiritual ambition that he had, that he pursued so relentlessly, has had a global impact, not only on world Jewry, but dare I say, on faith itself. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Brown. Uh, Dr. Reinhold, I know that you had a uh, very close and personal relationship with Rabbi Sachs and that he, uh, you knew him as a young, as a young budding scholar. Can you tell us a little bit about his influence? Uh, sure, certainly. Um, I knew him when I was a young scholar, obviously, um, as opposed to when he was. Um, but um, yeah, I mean, it's probably worth actually contextualizing this a little to begin with, because uh, back then, still today, uh, chief rabbi is a very important position, obviously, in Anglo Jewry. Uh, and Rabbi Sachs's predecessor, uh, Rabbi Lord Jacobowitz, had become a major public figure. Um, actually, the first one who, like Rabbi Sachs, was appointed to the House of Lords, uh, in the case of Lord Jacobowitz, by Margaret Thatcher. But, but Lord Jacobowitz was uh, born in Eastern Europe into a rabbinic family. So to me, as a modern Orthodox teenager growing up in London, you know, he was a more distant rabbinic figure, much respected, very important, but not really part of my world. And so not someone whose work I would have read necessarily or with whom I could envisage sitting down and having a cup of tea. Right. So not really someone I would have thought of as a role model in the sense of someone I could even think of emulating, which is not saying anything about him. It's just more about me and where I came from. Um, so I think it's important to understand that when Rabbi Sachs became chief rabbi in 1991, uh, for me and people like me, in these little pockets of modern orthodoxy that exist in England and in anglo jury modern orthodoxy, you know, doesn't have the numbers or indeed formal institutional backing, shall we say, uh, that it has in the US. So uh, people like me who are maybe at university or but active in the Jewish community and maybe looking potentially at careers within it, it suddenly felt like there was, so to speak, one of us in the chief rabbinate, right? So somebody who came from our world, he'd lived the life we had led, he'd had the same upbringing. Um, he even surrounded himself with people from our world. So people like back in the day, Simma Weinberg, who we knew because she was our friend's mum, right? So there was for the first time, someone representing our lives as chief rabbi. Um, and so age, say, 20 to 25, I, I think we really did look at him. Um, and I imagine, you know, Tamara would say exactly the same as someone we could almost aspire to be. Uh, obviously, laughed Dylan and all that. But uh, and many of us went on to forge careers in the Jewish world. And there's no question that I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing today, both literally today and more generally what I do, uh, were it not for him being in that position and more importantly the relationship that we forged because as i say we felt some kind of almost kinship with him so um uh, i remember that i guess as a result of this uh my first ever actual encounter with him was when myself and my my cousin who's now professor jonathan reinhold he's a professor of political science at bari lund um, I don't remember exactly how it came about, but we must have written to his chief of staff, Simmer Weinberg, um, and asked if we could interview Rabbi Sachs for a student publication. Um, and by the way, I'm not sure if that ever saw the light of day, and I keep meaning to ask Johnny if you still have the notes from the interview. Um, but she said certainly, she put in a word, and, and he said yes. So I think, number one, we were stunned. I was 20, Johnny was 22. Number two, when we got there, he sat with us for a long time. And you know how it is if you meet either important people or famous people meeting fans. Uh, you know, they might be ticking boxes, um, doing what they have to do, but their heart's not in it. But, but Rabbi Sachs, we're meeting him. He's the chief rabbi. We're a couple of kids. 
And he really gave us his full attention. And there was no question in our minds that he was enthused meeting us, right? Nothing like the extent to which we were meeting him. But at the time, it, it really mattered to us that I think he saw when he met young people who he felt maybe had potential to be, have, play a role in the next generation and really reinvigorate Anglo Jewry, particularly in what we would identify as modern Orthodox Spain, um, that he really seemed to care about reaching out to us. Uh, you know, he had the ear of prime ministers and what have you, but he would reach out to us, a group of young students, PhDs, maybe teachers, trainee rabbis, a um, couple of times a year, he would have us around his dining room table in Hamilton Terrace and, and we would study with him. I think Tamara was, was in those groups. Um, as a result, we could and we would reach out to him and he to us to discuss things and to, you know, that made us feel as if we maybe had something to contribute. And I think that there's, you know, there really is no question that many people went on to careers in Jewish communal life for that reason. Um, and that actually, in terms of, you know, personal interaction, um, brings me, you know, to, a, I guess, a second standout interaction, which is a little uncomfortable because it can't help but sound a bit like showing off, but it is important in terms of Rabbi Sachs's effect on me and, and many people like me. So if you bracket out the self-promotion piece here, um, I owe my television career, um, all five minutes of it to Rabbi Sachs. Um, he used to produce a 20 minute Rosh Hashanah message for the BBC every year. And in 1998, he decided he'd use it to highlight UK Jews from different walks of life in important professions and he would interview them. So he invited um, the first woman to be appointed as a judge in Scotland, Hazel Cosgrove, famous British actress from the time, Maureen Lippmann, and one of the UK, indeed the world's leading fertility doctors, Dr now himself Lord Robert Winston, um, and a teacher, me. And my wife still likes to imagine BBC audience of couples watching from their sofas at the end of the show when Rabbi Sachs's voiceover says, um, I won't try and emulate his, his sonorous tones, but he, he said, and so Judge Hazel Cosgrove and people nodded each other watching and Professor Robert Winston, Winston Maureen Lippmann, yeah, and Daniel Reinhold, who? And we just, now the point of the story is less the fond personal memories of that day spent with Rabbi Sachs and more the fact that he looked to push into the spotlight and promote and encourage, in that particular case me, but in countless cases, you know, people like me um, for, you know, his entire chief rabbinate because he believed in giving opportunities to the younger generation when he saw that potential. And in that case, quite honestly, the other three were known quantities and I was nobody. Uh, and that he was willing to take a chance on someone like that who he thought maybe had potential. Um, you know, he really would put himself out there for, for people who he, you know, believed in. Um, so as a leader and particularly a rabbinic leader to whom young people look for inspiration and guidance, uh, that's, you know, the value of that's inestimable. Um, so, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Reinhold. D Dr. Wright, can you speak a little bit about Rabbi Sachs as a rabbi, a mentor to you? Um, yes, absolutely. And so, first of all, thank you. Really, I'm honored to be here and I always enjoy uh, being in discussion with, with Daniel and with Erica. And Daniel, I just need to throw one thing into the mix before I go back to talking about Rabbi Sachs. Um, your, your television career, didn't that also include David Bedil referring to one of your shiurim as alternative <laughs> entertainment for the evening? <laughs> yeah, it wasn't on TV, but yes, that's true. <laughs> what was, so, so please share, just to lighten the mood a bit here, and then I'll move on. <laughs> uh, there's a famous Jewish comedian in the UK, his name's David Bedil, um, and he was doing a, sh a live stand-up show, and it was a Jewish event, and a some friends of mine were there and they came back and they said to me, you were mentioned in his stand-up comedy. And I wondered what on earth they were talking about. And apparently he had opened by saying, 
what are you all doing here? Kind of all you Jews come out to see me. You could have been at, and he looked at the listings in the Jewish paper that week, what was on at the same time. And apparently I was teaching at the London School of Jewish Studies at that time. And he said, you could have been at Daniel Reinhold teaching the guide of the perplex. Oh, I see why you're here. That was, yeah, so that was <laughs> my appearance in a stand-up routine. <laughs> Right, great. Sorry, sorry to embarrass you in that way. And unless I'm going to call you upon you in a minute as well. But um, going back to the stated agenda. So, Erica, I arrived in London one year before you. Um, and I also found my way to Jews College, where I had the great privilege of studying Jewish ethics with, with Rabbi Sachs, that's all. Um, a year later, he did us the honor of officiating at our wedding. And at this point, let me see, am I allowed to share a screen now? Uh, am I able to share my screen? Yes, just one moment, I'll give you. You should, you should be able to. I should be able to, ah, there it is, okay. So share a screen and there we are. Can everybody see that? Okay. So if you can see that little photo, um, and actually I, I might just zoom in a little bit. The gentleman um, with the less gray beard than we're familiar with is Rabbi Sachs. That's our wedding taking place at Yakar in Hendon in Northwest London um, in the summer of 1988. And I want to tell you a little bit of a story um, about that wedding. Okay, so um, I, as you can imagine, Rabbi Sachs, even back then, was extremely articulate. And when he addressed the young couple under the chuppah, his speech was an absolute exemplar. It was a model of oratory, insight, and erudition. However, there was one slight flaw, which is that he referred to my studies at Oxford, although at the time I had only spent an afternoon there. Um, Nevertheless, looking back over the last, uh, the past three and a half decades, I'm really so grateful for the many opportunities I had to learn from Rabbi Sachs, to work with him at Jews College, which then became the London School of Jewish Studies, um, and together with Daniel and with Rabbi Dr. Michael Harris to co-edit Radical Responsibility in his honor. And indeed, actually, one of the most memorable moments of my career was when we handed Rabbi Sachs' copy of the book and looking over the table of contents, he exclaimed, I love this, it has all my heroes in it. So to be honest, I actually sometimes struggle to remember precisely what I learned from Rabbi Sachs. And it's not simply a matter of forgetting, although I'm sure there's a lot of that involved. I think that the influence of a great teacher is such that it can be hard to find the boundary between what I myself has long believed about a topic and what has been presented to me in such a profoundly compelling way that it's hard to imagine that I ever thought otherwise. There's an exception to this that I want to talk about, and that is the idea of Lashon Hatov. It's something that I can clearly remember being introduced to by Rabbi Sachs, first through his own actions, which I'll speak about in a minute, um, and later through his explicit teaching. The importance of avoiding Lashan Hara, of course, has long been emphasized in sermons, books, and popular guard your tongue programs. But until Rabbi Sachs took up the cause, the idea that there is a mitzvah to speak well about other people was definitely lacking an, equ an equivalent PR campaign. Rabbi Sachs explained that Lashan Hatov is as creative as Lashan Hara is destructive. Drawing on Pirke Avot, he explored the ethical and pedagogic functions of praise. The very first statement he wrote includes the principle, raise up many disciples. And we've just heard from Erica and from Daniel how Rabbi Sachs did that. Rabbi Sachs continues, but how? How do you inspire people to reach the full measure of their potential? Answer, by acting as did Robin Yochanan ben Zakkai when he praised his students, showing them their specific strengths. He used praise not so much to describe as to motivate. And that is Lashon Tov. More generally, Rabbi Sachs taught that being generous in our praise of others falls within the commandments of love your neighbor as yourself. He saw a very deep spiritual significance in this idea of Lashon HaTov. We think religion is about faith in God, he wrote, but faith in God should lead us to have faith in people. 
For God's image is in each of us, and we have to learn how to discern it. The repeated phrase in Genesis 1, and God saw that it was good, is there to teach us to see the good in people and events, and by so doing, help to strengthen that goodness. And again, I would say, you know, referring back to what, what Daniel and Erica have already told us, that effort that Rabbi Sachs made of speaking Lashon Hatov, to, particularly to young people and encouraging them, um, I think, you know, it had repercussions and impact far beyond what he could have imagined at the time. Speaking personally, I remember how surprised I was when, as a young scholar, I received a call from the chief rabbi's office a few days before Rosh Hashanah. Rabbi Sachs came on the line and told me that he had enjoyed reading an article I had published earlier that year. I thanked him, and I waited for him to tell me the main reason he was calling. But that was it. There was nothing else on his agenda. Picking up on my surprise, he simply explained that it, it was his custom to thank scholars whose work had been helpful to him during the year. And subsequently, every once in a while, I will notice that a, a colleague has published a book or um, something will make me think of an author whose work has been really helpful to me and I'll fire off an email to them. And I will tend to hesitate and think, well, they don't want to hear from me. They're busy, whatever. Uh, but then I remember Rabbi Sachs and I always get, a, you know, a very positive and very warm response. Anyway, uh, that small act of encouragement way back when left a deep, deep impression. And I'm sure, as we've already spoken about, that Daniel and Erica have heard so many similar stories from other rabbis, educators and scholars. Oh, by the way, going back to that chuppah. That little mistake that Rabbi, uh, Rabbi Sachs made three decades ago when he talked about my studies at Oxford. I guess that made an impression too. After many years of delivering guest lectures at, in the Divinity School at Cambridge, which as we know was Rabbi Sachs's alma mater, I've recently been appointed to a visiting research fellowship at St. Bennett's Hall, Oxford. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Wright. So I, we, at this point, we've heard really uh, three different aspects of Rabbi Sachs's influence as a teacher. We heard from Dr. Brown about the importance of a rabbi as a thinker and as someone who, who reads and brings to his audience, his congregation, um, new ideas and a way to broaden their connection with both Judaism and their general thinking. Um, and that, that's certainly something we can, we, can, uh, we can be inspired by as rabbis. From Dr. Reinhold, we heard about how he took an interest in the young, uh, young people and raised them up to, uh, and inspired them to, to do great things. And we heard similar things from Dr. Wright about the power of those positive words. Uh, I, I remember I saw, I, I, uh, I heard Rabbi Sachs speak a number of times as a visiting scholar in various synagogues, and invariably the first seven minutes or so of his 40-minute presentation was speaking about how great the rabbi of the synagogue was. Um, so I, 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 heard, I heard that myself. Um, I, I think we, we can turn now to our second segment of our, of our presentation. Um, and that is that we heard a lot about his methodologies and about what he meant as a rabbi and as a mentor. But he also was a deep philosopher and a deep thinker, as Dr. Brown mentioned. Um, and we, as rabbis who may or may not be totally familiar with all of his, all of Rabbi Sachs, uh, Rabbi Sachs's philosophy, we'd love to hear what you think are the most significant aspects of Rabbi Sachs's philosophy for our community moving forward. Uh, what can we take from his teachings um, as, as important teachings for the modern Orthodox community? Um, why don't we start with you, Dr. Reinhold? Um, sure. Thank you. Um, so um, one of the things actually that Erica mentioned, which is incredibly important, um, is his uh, translation of abstract and theoretical ideas that he had read and, and as, as Erica said, he read voraciously, um, translating them for a general audience, but in a way that didn't dilute them. Um, and one of the things that um, that really that, that struck home for me as a Jewish philosopher and philosophically speaking, probably the most impactful idea um, is one that initially got him into a little bit of hot water when he published Dignity of Difference in 2002. 
but it's an incredibly important question. It was then, still is today. Um, and basically it comprises his attempt to, to navigate the, I guess, the, you know, Geshad Sarama order between universalism and particularism. Um, and it's a question that's always fascinated me, continues to do so, and clearly uh, became incredibly important to, to Rabbi Sachs, um, in particular after 9-11, which is when he um, wrote this book. Um, so on the one hand, to kind of present the basic idea, um, if one believes in, believes in a version of Orthodox Judaism, Right, so clearly you believe it's in some sense the truth or the right path, otherwise why would you do it? Um, and I say believes here because um, he's specifically speaking of those who believe it as opposed to people who may not necessarily believe it fully but might remain in the fold for other reasons, whether social, communal, not to judge, that's just not his topic. Um, so if one believes in orthodoxy, sincerely, you believe it's the truth or the right path. At the same time, um, one may, I have, struggled with an absolutist conception of religion or truth in the practical sphere. Um, and to explain, so for one thing, there's a more epistemological question concerned with, with our knowledge, right? So I, for one, more importantly, Rabbi Sachs, couldn't believe that anyone who doesn't believe what we do is stupid, right? As in, well, why can't they see the obvious truth of, of Judaism, what's wrong with them? Uh, so clearly there are plenty of intelligent, moral people in the world and vanishingly few of them are Orthodox Jews. Uh, and the question is, can that really be a failure to follow some obvious argument or chain of reasoning? Right, in Judah, in Judah, of course, we've always recognized, you know, Chassidei Omato Alam, we, we, we have a, a more um, tolerant tradition, certainly, uh, than many. Uh, but the question then arises, so if, if belief or faith isn't a case of something you can philosophically justify by appeal to some, you know, deductive argument from first principles, so anyone who's reasoning correctly will arrive there, why would God create humankind, implant them with a yearning for truth and transcendence, but then deny any possibility of reaching that to 99 plus percent of them, right? Uh, creates a moral question, right? Would God really vouchsafe the truth to a tiny minority of the world population, Orthodox Jews, uh, and let anyone who isn't an Orthodox Jew just rot, whether here or in an Olam Haba? Right, so it's morally problematic. So for Rabbi Sachs, in the dignity of difference, the belief in one single absolute truth, such that if I'm right, everyone else is wrong, rested on what he saw as a historical error of great moment that became deeply embedded in Western consciousness, and he called it Plato's ghost. And to boil it down to its most basic terms, you know, the claim is that truth, all truth is universal. So it's like math. If you don't believe two and two equals four, then you're not being rational. You're not following kind of, you know, rational thought. And the problem is if you believe that and believe that people, if they all think rationally will reach that truth and come to the same conclusions and you apply that to everything, including religion, then your religion has to be universally accepted. If you reject mine, you're at best wrong, at worst evil and contempt to damnation or something. So while ancient tribalism might be thought of as bad, right, yielding tribal wars, etc., universalism leads to just as much conflict in his mind and is equally dangerous. Um, and he, he, you know, his interpret interpretation of Migdal Bavel is, is exactly along those lines, that it's a rejection of that type of imperialism. Uh, so for Rabbi Sachs, Judaism teaches indeed models what he called the dignity of difference. And, and what does that mean? What we all have in common is obviously of great importance, but what makes us fully human is to do with what differentiates us, our cultures, our religions, our families, right? Those things matter. And if you think about it, the reason we care about our kids, if we have kids, is because they're our kids. 
And the point of that doesn't strike us as, as wrong, right? We don't think of that as a problem because I'm not treating all ch children equally if I should, right? If all that matters is their universal value, which by the way is real, of course, and children are valuable, right? But they are who they are and we are who we are because of what's particular about us. And for Rabbi Sachs, that, well, that's the thing that lies at the foundation of what makes us human beings. It's part and parcel of what makes us human beings. It's essential to it. And for him, this is a central pillar of Judaism. It's an idea we bring to the world. It's our story, right? We go from the universal, Adam Rishon, through to Noah, which of course doesn't work, right? That ends in disaster. Why? Because trying to level off all of humanity, teach them one universal lesson doesn't work. So we go to one particular person or family of Ramavinu, and that does. But from there, we aim to reach out again to the universal by not modeling one particular godly way of life that others can somehow maybe participate in in their own way. But we do so unapologetically from our particular locations, which are what form us. Uh, and what's so important about the way Rabbi Sachs does this, and this really, I think, is, is the most fundamental thing, is that he doesn't do it by trying to explain Judaism in universal terms, on the one hand, nor does he double down on a particularism that would condemn everybody else to an irredeemably error-ridden or evil way of life that leads to rack and ruin. So what he tries to teach and what he sees as a thread through Judaism is that it's a, and this is actually a quotation of his, um, I'll read it to you, a protest against empires because imperialism and its latter-day successors, totalitarianism and fundamentalism, are attempts to impose a single truth on a plural world. And today we often see, you know, many of us doubling down on differences and, and frankly weaponizing them to stir up conflict, um, regardless of, you know, where you are. Uh, the key idea of dignity and diversity for Rabbi Sachs is a basic Jewish idea. And the way he put it, which I love, is that faith is like being secure in one's home, yet moved by the beauty of foreign places. Knowing they're someone else's home, not mine, but still part of the glory of the world that is ours. Um, and I think it's that absolute belief in Judaism, unapologetic belief, unwillingness to translate it into universal terms, because that just, you don't, you're left with something that isn't Judaism anymore. And yet, seeing that particularism as a model for particularisms where you can still share certain key moral concerns is uh, you know the key to his dignity of difference and something that he genuinely believed was deeply rooted in Judaism in a way that it simply isn't in other religions. Thank you so much uh, Dr. Reinhold. Um, uh, there'll be some time for questions for all three of our uh, speakers at the end of this uh, at the end of this session. But uh, we'll now hear from Dr. Erica Brown. Uh, thank you. Um, Tamara, side question. Did <clears throat> Rabbi Sachs quote Robert Browning under your chuppah? I have, I have this memory. I have to say, Erica, I don't remember. We do have a video. I will see if we can check the record for you in the future. <laughs> I thank you for your chat message as well. I say that because I remember hearing him speak under your chuppah and it was the first time I'd ever heard a rabbi sort of put together the type of sources that he put together in sort of sanctifying and officiating at this, at that kind of union. So it just, it, it sort of stuck in my head, but we'll, we'll be in touch offline. Um, Wonderful. I, uh, what I want to say actually is a perfect segue from, uh, from Daniel's important remarks. Uh, about the home, right? In other words, you know, you can live in a home and feel that other places are beautiful. And um, and uh, specifically about a book that is not well known on American shores, um, this is Rabbi Sachs's book, uh, The Home We Build Together. 
And this was, I think, an answer to the question that I initially asked from traditional alternatives. How far should Jews in the diaspora be involved in the moral and social issues of their wider society? One of the patterns that I've noticed in Rabbi Sachs's writing is that he would write books for an internal audience, more or less, right? Um, you know, his uh, his parshanut is, um, and and uh, please God, I just checked yesterday. His commentary on um, his commentary on the Chumash will be coming out through Koran um, in in only a few months. Uh, there were books that he wrote internally for the Jewish community, and there were books I think he wrote for what he saw as the broader community in need of Jewish wisdom. And I would certainly categorize his last book, Morality. In, in that vein, I don't think that there are a lot of things in the book that he does not say in other books, but he uh, he packages them and distills them in a way that um, that I think speaks profoundly to um, to a broader not only faith community but to addressing the world's ills, the ill of loneliness, the ill of power imbalances, um, the ills of technology, and the and the importance and the and the and the possibilities that technology um, offers. And um, this book is important to me because I think it presented a model for how to digest faith ideas and to um, and to prop them up as solutions to larger um, societal problems. And the problem in specific that he was addressing is that Britain was supposed to be a, month, a multicultural society. And yet it was failing in that enterprise. And the reason he was failing, he used, he used a metaphor throughout the book. And that is that it's like a country house. The society is like a country house and you're invited for the weekend to the country home. But the country home is not something that you feel comfortable in. You wouldn't go to the refrigerator as a visitor to someone's country home. You would be a recipient and hopefully be granted the favor of someone's generosity. And what Rabbi Sachs wanted to suggest is that is a terrible model for building a multicultural society. It has to be a home that we all build together and therefore we all feel deeply comfortable in that home. And one of the ideas that he discusses in, I, I believe it's every single book of his, is how covenant, the concept of covenant, is what creates a different type of society that enables this, uh, that enables the transition from the country home idea to the home we build together construct. And um, I wanna talk about it in the way that he defines it in morality. But for those of you who are interested and have a bunch of his uh, books, you might wanna look in the table of contents and you'll see very, very similar descriptions and definitions of covenant. He feels it's always important to describe covenant. And for those of you regulars getting, as uh, as Roy mentioned, um, you know, people, uh, his sermons competing, covenant and conversation competing with it. it was, it's as if the conversation needs to be framed within the lens of covenant. So here in morality, he says, uh, a covenant generates a different kind of relationship altogether. He says what, what makes a covenant different is that two or more individuals, each respecting the dignity and integrity of the other, come together in a bond of love and trust to share their interests, sometimes to share their lives, by pledging their faithfulness to one another to do together what they cannot achieve alone. But it's not a it's not utilitarian in nature. For Rabbi Sachs, the covenant is uh, a combination of law and love. Um, it's different than a contract. And he defines, he establishes these differences and, uh, in, in many different places. He says a contract is a transaction, a covenant is a relationship. A contract is about interests, a covenant is about identity. And that is why contracts benefit, but covenants transform. And he believed that individuals and societies who set about to uh, to minimize power structures and to create co covenantal relationships would actually create transformative societies, societies where people could feel protected and cared for, where what he called the grammar of compassion would be evident. And, um, and he felt that that was something that Judaism had to offer society as a as a as a respite from the loneliness that society that that is so often experienced in societies, um, you know he he liked to use uh, demographic studies and uh, sociological studies here in morality he does he has a whole chapter on loneliness and 
um, for him, the, the, the notion of covenant, if we can, he, he believed was, it was revolutionary to the Bible. Um, it was, uh, in, in, in the ancient world, he describes in the home we build together, societies, uh, a covenant was between the stronger and the weaker with the imbalance of power and a demand of fealty to the stronger. He said, Judaism revolutionized that. The gift of Judaism to the world was not only monotheism, it was the notion of covenants as equalizers, um, economic equalizers and social equalizers, not the strong to uh, the strong to the weak and the, with the weak subservient to the strong, but a more egalitarian society um, that was structured by law and colored by love. And I think um, I think that's he promoted that idea throughout his writings because he saw the breakdown of basic societal structures like marriage. Um, like birth rates, right, um, and and and, um, and 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 communal institutions not being able to provide a respite from some of these uh, from some of these ills. So that's uh, that's that's something that I think travels through a lot of his thinking and a lot of his writing. And I'll turn it over to Tamara. Oh, thank you, Erica, and thank you, Daniel, and um, just you know. As a confession, the philosophical world that I come from um, is not a world of clarity. So my background is in continental philosophy. And many jokes in the UK have been made at the expense of continental philosophy. We won't go there right now. But um, as I was listening to both Erica and Daniel, one of the things that I was reflecting on is that um, there, there was a, a beautiful clarity in both of your expositions of Rabbi Sachs's thought. And there's a beautiful clarity in his own thoughts. And, um, you know, Daniel and I and a few others have, or you know, many other people, I suppose, have been rereading a lot of Rabbi Sachs's work over the past several months. And uh, one of the things that I've noticed is that in the early writings, there is more attention paid to, um, to European Jewish philosophy. You see more of Buber and of Rosenzweig and, of course, of, of Rav Soloveitchik. Um, and over time, uh, what I, you know, see is Rabbi Sachs moving further and further away from that world. Um, and partly it seems like he's not interested in a Judaism that is about angst and dialectic and in a philosophical language that is opaque and challenging. And um, uh, when we were preparing for the, the London launch of Radical Responsibility, Aviva Zornberg and I went to have a, a sort of pre-panel meeting with Rabbi Sachs in Hamilton Terrace. And we had a very interesting conversation. And one of the things that came up was the difference between them on this whole question of clarity. And uh, Rabbi Sachs insisted that there's a moral obligation to be clear. And Aviva Zornberg, being Aviva Zornberg said, not everything that needs to be said can be said clearly. Um, so I, you know, I'm fascinated by that debate and that discussion. And one of the things that I, you know, so admire about Rabbi Sachs's research and his writing is that he is able to put things very clearly such that they sound really simple. But if you know the background, you know the literature and you appreciate the research he's, he's done, you know, the original sources weren't that clear. The original ideas weren't that simple. And he's just created this thing of, of great beauty. Okay. And um, so I want to move though to, uh, to a different interest of mine, which is less philosophical, but my, uh, one of the ways in which I deeply appreciate what Rabbi Sachs did was that he, um, some oh. of his ideas were very suggestive of other ways of thinking that other people might pursue. And, uh, and one of them was this idea that he, he mentioned several times in Shurim, but I haven't actually found it in writing. I'm, I'm still looking. But he mentioned this idea that, um, that there's, so first of all, he talks about what kind of psychology is Jewish, right? And he uh, is very dismissive of Freudian psychology. Um, following from the work of Professor Mordechai Rottenberg, he talks about uh, Freud's approach as actually being more Greek than Jewish. Um, but there are psychologists that Rabbi Sachs thought of as much more Jewish in their approach. And in particular, he would cite uh, Viktor Frankl, um, 
uh, Erin Beck, who created cognitive behavior therapy, CBT, and Martin Seligman, who created positive psychology. And there's a link between those two schools of thought, both kind of historically. So Seligman was a student of Beck, um, but also in terms of the, the sort of conceptual framework. And what Rabbi Sachs emphasized was that um, positive psychology like logotherapy and CBT rejects purely deterministic understandings of human feelings and behavior and instead emphasizes human freedom. As such, Rabbi Sachs argued, it is more in tune with Judaism than the so-called, as I said, Jewish science of Freudian psychoanalysis. So Rabbi Sachs suggested um, at various times that one could create a new Musa. Um, and the first few times I heard him suggest this, he specifically said Judaism plus CBT. And then later on, I think as he was exposed to the thought of Martin Seligman and became friendly with him, he would say Judaism and positive psychology. And sometimes he would say um, both of them. And what I'd like to do for a few moments is just to return to Rabbi Sachs' discussion of Lashan Hatov as an example of what the new Musa might look like. Um, and we have mentioned already that Rabbi Sachs had this great gift of making sa things sound simple but without being simplistic. And I think, you know, the risk if we just quote very selectively as I've done so far from what he had to say about La Chant uh, Tov is that it sounds very simplistic. Well, don't we all know that it's good to be nice to people and don't we all know that it's good to praise people? Um, but in the few places where Rabbi Sachs explored this idea of La Chant Tov, um, he brought together both cutting edge psychological research and traditional Jewish sources, and he did so in such a way that shows that there's a lot to think about um, in, the, in terms of the way that we praise people. Okay, so um, in terms of thinking about the risks associated with praising others, um, I'm talking to a collection of esteemed rabbis, so you all know that there's halakhic literature raising concerns that by praising someone in the presence of others, you might provoke somebody else to speak Lashan Hara about them. Okay, and there's this, you know, this idea that maybe you should refrain from praising people publicly just in case the conversation goes off in the wrong direction. Um, I'm more interested in the psychological literature, which is concerned with the nature and the impact of praise itself. So here Rabbi Sachs cites the influential research of Carol Dweck and Dweck's exploration of the distinction between what she calls a fixed mindset and a growth mindset. And this highlights the danger of praise that focuses on innate capability rather than effort, progress, and specific outcomes. Summarizing Dweck, Rabbi Sachs wrote, people who take the fixed mindset approach tend to be risk averse, afraid that if they fail, this will show that they are not as good as they were thought to be. The growth mindset group embrace risk because they take failure as a learning experience from which they can grow. And this actually um, reminds me of, I can't remember if you were there, Daniel, but there was a time when we, um, we met with Rabbi Sachs at his house and he was in hot water for something. It might have been dignity of difference. It might have been something else. And I remember he said to us at the time, look, guys, you know, relax. Um, over the years, he said, I've learned a lot about criticism. And um, there are only two possibilities. Either your critics are right and you learn or they're wrong and you just move on, right? So I think that that's, you know, is again, again an example of this kind of growth mindset um, where you say, okay, I'm open to feedback and, you know, I want to be able to learn. Okay, going back to the quote from Rabbi Sachs. Um, he said, it follows that there is good praise and bad praise. Parents and teachers should not praise children in absolute terms. Instead, they should praise efforts. They should encourage a growth mindset, not a fixed one. And so Rabbi Sachs takes this idea from contemporary psychology and he pl applies it to familiar texts from Pirkei Avot. Um, and so the next Mishnah after the one that I quoted before reads, Rabbi Yochanan ben Zaka used to say, if all the sages of Israel were in one scale of a balance and Eliezer ben Hyrcanus in the other, he would outweigh them all. However, Abba Saul said in his name, if all the sages of Israel, including Eliezer ben Hyrcanus, were in one scale of balance, and Elazar ben Arach in the other, he would outweigh them all. 
Rabbi Sachs suggests that Ben Zakkai's effusive praise of these two disciples was ultimately counterproductive. Tragically, one was eventually excommunicated by his colleagues for failing to accept the majority view on the matter of halakha, while the other became separated from his colleagues, forgot his learning, and became a pale shadow of his former self. Drawing on Dwank, Rabbi Sachs concluded, it may be that by praising his students for their innate abilities rather than their effort, Ben Zakkai inadvertently encouraged his two most talented students to develop, to develop a fixed mindset rather than engage with colleagues and stay open to intellectual growth. The right kind of praise, Rabbi Sachs continued, changes lives. That is the power of Lashan Hatov. Bad speech diminishes us, good speech can lift us to great heights. So Rabbi Sachs discussed this idea of Lashon HaTov several times in his Covenant and Conversation series. I haven't conveyed all of the important ideas he covered, but I hope that by highlighting his use of traditional Jewish sources and cutting edge psychological research to explore a topic in ethics that is relevant to every one of us in our day-to-day -day lives, I've given some indication of what a new Musa literature might look like. Thanks. Thank you so much. I think that we really learned a lot about uh, Rabbi Sachs's philosophy in, uh, in these in three different areas. Uh, one about particularism and universalism and what it means to be a particularist community and religion in a universalist world. We spoke about building community and building community through covenant as opposed, uh, as opposed to uh, contracts. And finally, uh, we, we heard a lot about uh, Rabbi Sachs's um, approach to a new Musser inspired by uh, positive psychology and CBT. Um, so thank you so much to all three of you. I, I do think that we have some time for questions. I know that uh, one of our panelists has to leave uh, soon um, as you're teaching, but um, if, if we have a few minutes uh, for, for questions from the, uh, the people around, I will, um, I'll take the liberty of unspotlighting everyone so that we can all see each other on the, uh, gallery view. Yeah. <clears throat> so why can I uh, can I start off? What what was Rabbi Sachs's view of, of, of the rabbinate? And um, what do you think he would how do you think it would encourage the RC, RCA rabbis <clears throat> today to engage with the challenges that we uh, that we have? Um, Erica, I know you had some, or Dr. Reinhold, sure. No, no, Erica, please go ahead. Um, look, I, I think, um, I, 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 I mean, I can't speak for him. I, I don't even think, I, I feel even uncomfortable, you know, in that, in that realm. But I, I do think that there's a lot of insularity in the <clears throat> Orthodox community that I think he would be saddened by. I think he saw the job of, of a rabbi as, on the one hand, growing one's own kila, but also using Judaism to, to grow wider concepts that would benefit the world. That's, I think Daniel spoke to that, Tamara spoke to that, and I spoke to that in different ways. And I, I think insularity would have troubled him. Um, the, the, the fact that, uh, you know, he took on, for example, the idea of tikkun olam. So a lot of Orthodox Jews wouldn't talk about, you know, he called it to heal a fractured world. He understood that this was, um, this was sort of the lingua franca in the, in the reform community. And there were a lot of Orthodox rabbis, don't touch it, don't say it, don't. And he basically said, let's write a book about this. And it was what's, what's worthy and venerable in this that, that we can begin to have a conversation about. Um, I actually, um, I don't know, Daniel and Tamara, if you had this opportunity, I, I got to see him as a, as a pulpit rabbi. Um, and um, it, it, it was actually a very, very touching thing to have a front row seat in his class where he might be talking about Jeremy Bentham and a piece of Talmud and then watch him hold the hand of an elderly man and sing a song. Um, that's not a Rabbi Sachs that many people have had a chance to see, that sort of one-on-one -on -one tenderness or um, making himself available. I think he might 
he might say mentor young people. Um, I, I, and uh, you know, I, I, I can, I think I shared this in our, in our practice run. Um, Alex Israel was a student of mine at the sixth form center in Jews college, which was a place where students who were going to what we would call uh, private schools, what we'll call public schools in England, um, private schools, um, want, went for the equivalent of juniors and seniors in high school went for Jewish studies. And I, um, sometimes I'd have a student and I'd say, I, I think you, you should talk to Rabbi Sachs and Alex Israel is one of my students. And, um, you know, that conversation in many ways, I think changed and changed his life. And so this investment that we make in young people to grow them, um, as Tamara was speaking, I bent over to get my, a letter that I have saved from Rabbi Sachs from July 16th of 1990, where I had finished my thesis and he commented on it. Um, I hope you'll go on to write a doctorate and and, and then uh, some other kind words. And um, I I don't I don't know if I saw myself as a doctoral candidate, um, but because he saw me as that, it helped me see myself as that. And I think there's a little too much competition amongst rabbis, and maybe not as much growing, um, growing and mentoring and opening the eyes and reading and sort of bringing people into this, um, you know, larger you know, larger world that is a loving world. Yeah, if I could just add one brief thing, I think also what Rabbi Sachs had was the ability to have vision for the future. I mean, you know, even a book like, Will We Have Jewish Grandchildren? He was always thinking five, 10, 20 years, a generation ahead. And I, and I think, um, I think in the Jewish community generally, because there are, we are so often in a state of crisis um, that often leaders find it difficult to actually think about the bigger picture and think longer term because we're so often in this kind of reactive crisis driven mode. Yeah, I mean, the thing that I was going to say, um, other than kind of pretty much what, what Erica said, um, but the other thing which, I, which I'm not sure it is particularly helpful in terms of um, advice, but just in terms of, uh, again, what he modeled is I remember very distinctly, um, I don't think this was the same time you were talking about Tamara, but um, going to his house, Motzei Shabbat, when the dignity of difference for Rore blew up. Um, and uh, I remember him speaking to us, there were three of us there that we were, um, we'd arranged a conference on Rumbum, I think it was the next day, so, because we happened to all be there. Um, he asked us over and he went through what was going on and he was really profoundly affected by it. Clearly he was very, I'd never seen him, I never saw him again that upset. But I do remember him saying that uh, if you're the shepherd of the flock and you're so far away that they can't see you anymore, then you're no longer a good shepherd. Um, I remember that particular metaphor distinctly um and like i said i don't know how helpful but just in terms of the, the response the sense of responsibility i suppose that, it, that he felt um uh, for his own rabbinate at that you know it's the chief rabbi talking to the rabbis uh was was, was profound are there other questions from the uh rabbis rabbi strockler I wanted to ask about Rabbi Sachs's uh, identification uh, as a uh, religious leader to the world at the expense um, uh, of the chief rabbinate on one stage of his life, but also of um, modern orthodoxy and the degree to which Rabbi Sachs would uh, identify as a modern orthodox rabbi. So uh, obviously he never changed who he was in terms of his beliefs. But there was a certain strategic decision that he made somewhere along the line, which is that he wasn't going to be a, a rabbi of a of a minority of a minority of a minority. And um, where did that insight come from? And what are the the outcomes of that insight for us? Um, I'm happy to, to. It's nice to see you, Rabbi Shachter. I'm happy to take just a. a I, I don't know that it was strategic in the way that you're speaking about it, and I may be totally speaking out of turn, but I think um, I think Rabbi Sachs understood that, the, that he had a larger message that was not always received within the sometimes intellectually narrow community in which he um, in which he served. And, and I think Daniel, you know you, you pointed to that in the dignity of difference argument. 
I remember when he became chief rabbi and he was campaigning for chief rabbi. You know, he, he gave the Lord Jakovitz, you know, annual lecture and, you know, he was creating a school and, and being the intellectual and ideological um, architect of that school. He created a fantastic, you know, wrote a fantastic paper about what a graduate of a modern Orthodox day school should know. I think traditional alternatives is really an explication of what he saw the richness of modern orthodoxy could look like. Uh, but I, I had asked him, I think a year into it, Rabbi Sachs, you know, I asked him what he's writing and he said, writing, he said, I just eat salmon dinners, right? Um, and it was, you know, it's sort of a, a joke and I, I don't, I didn't believe him for a second that he wasn't reading and writing, but I think he understood that there were prices to pay for, for the positions that one gets in. And at the same time in this, uh, you know, this is uh, Rabbi Dretsch to, to, you know, addresses a question that you, that you raised. I think he understood that the way that Judaism has influence is by influencing people um, who are outside of Judaism. Um, and um, I, I think he, you know, I, if anyone listened to the eulogy that Prince Charles gave to Lord Sachs, which I think was so, so deep and such a profound statement of friendship, this wasn't simply, you know, a, a little message out of Buckingham Palace. This was someone who understood that if you want Judaism to change the world, you need to go out to world leaders and make sure they know about Judaism and what Judaism's gifts are. And so maybe that's another answer to your question, Rabbi Dratch, of what do you tell rabbis is, you know, along with your congregation, think of people of influence who may actually change other people by, you know, as, as a result of their learning, learning with them. Yeah, I'd probably, I'd also add that um, uh, the, position of chief rabbi um, is, uh, or that was bequeathed to him, frankly, from Lord Jakovitz, was uh, as a religious leader in the UK, as opposed to uh, a kind of um, mega pulpit rabbi, so to speak, right? Um, and he really did become, you know, the voice of religion. In, a, in what's still a Christian country in the UK. Uh, his books were serialized in the London Times. Um, and so the, the position of chief rabbi uh, increasingly, I think, has become or, or was becoming uh, during that period and preceding him uh, very much to be an oral agoyim. And, and he really exemplified that. Uh, that's, that's number one. Number two, I think the other part of, of, of your question Rabbi Stratley is that, yeah, you know what, it's an impossible job. Um, I'll never forget my PhD advise, <coughs> advisor right at the beginning was somebody called Alan Montefiore, um, who's Jewish and was son or grandson of the founder of liberal Judaism. So this is somebody who was Jewish, but, you know, had, had kind of um, uh, left religious Judaism. Um, at that point. I'm not sure he even identified with liberal Judaism particularly. Uh, and I remember him saying to me, uh, this was right at the beginning, Rabbi Sachs might not have even taken the job yet. I remember him saying to me, why would such an intelligent man take that job? Um, <laughs> and I think, you know, just in terms of the, the difficulty and where he succeeded was in, uh, you know, teaching, uh, you know, the masses, both Jewish and non-Jewish, key things that, you know, hopefully could filter down to how we treat each other within Jewish denominations. Uh, but yeah, I think the position was uh, kind of tailored or, or beginning to be tailored in that direction. And he just took it, took it to the next level. And once he was no longer chief rabbi, I think that's where the Jewish effects of it really paid off because, you know, he would go to Israel or to or come to the US and he was like a rock star. You know, you don't get 400 people turning up at why you on a Friday morning to hear anyone, but Rabbi said that happened. So I think it ultimately kind of, um, he was almost paying it forward and it paid off in terms of his uh, uh, Jewish audience, uh, maybe after uh, he was no longer chief rabbi. Um, thank I you. We have, we have... I just want to say just two quick things, if that's okay. 
Um, I think that he, after his death, uh, Dan, he became sort of the chief rabbi of the English speaking world, you know, it was, sort of, it was an unofficial position, but I, I, I can't let this close without saying this. Um, I never felt from Rabbi Sachs as a woman that he did not take me seriously. There was, n he never, ever um, brought that into the equation, uh, not when I was teaching in a synagogue, not in as a student. I don't know, Tamara, if you had a similar experience. And I think that was very formative for me because I had learned with many stellar figures who did make that distinction, who sort of, it, there was a second tier. And I think, um, I, I think part of that encouragement, um, you know, I think he was interested in people who took Judaism seriously. He was interested in people who took ideas seriously and the other things he could push aside. And so to Daniel's point about stepping into a, a position of influence and becoming what, you know, what, what, what his brother, um, Alan called the, you know, the voice of faith in Britain was largely because he wasn't in, interested in all the barriers that people kept throwing at him, whether that was gender or denomination or religion. He wanted to have a serious conversation. And if you wanted to join him, you know, he was there for it. Yeah, I mean, Eric, I agree with you. And I also wanted to add, just um, as you were both talking, I was thinking about events where I was able to observe Rabbi Sachs on a stage with other major religious leaders. And the thing that was always clear, you know, the other leaders knew a lot, they were intelligent, they were intellectual, they had interesting things to say. But it always felt to me like they hadn't done the work that Rabbi Sachs had done in order to learn how to really truly connect with an audience and how to pitch, you know, to have the right mix of jokes and anecdotes and serious ideas and how to really, you know, pitch their ideas and connect with the audience. And, you know, it was sort of like every time he got a new platform, whether it was thought for the day on the radio or, you know, the BBC Rosh Hashanah shows or whatever it was. So he just sort of naturally grew as a kind of, as a media talent because he was so much better than anybody in that space. Thank you so much. We have one more question from Rabbi Bergman. Hi there. And if I could just mention, I, I watched once his talk in Emory University, where there, there was the Dalai Lama, and there was like a Christian and a Muslim um, scholar. And I, I felt bad for everybody, because every time Rabbi Sachs spoke, he got a standing ovation. And that was far from the case with everybody else. So uh, that was a lot of nachas there. My question is, what do you think Rabbi Sachs would tell us now, in the wake of just the conflict of, you know, the last couple of weeks in Israel, the rise in anti-Semitism, and just the incredible criticism levied against the state of Israel. Um, what, do you, what would you say he would say? Thank you. I think the first thing he would say, I mean, he wouldn't actually say this, but would think it is told you so. Um, I mean, he wrote a while ago, about this mutating virus that was anti-Semitism and the way that anti-Zionism had, you know, was now the convenient cover for it. Um, and so, you know, he really did see this uh, some time ago. I'm trying to remember when he first, you know, wrote about that, maybe, uh, you know, Erica or Tamara. Um, but yeah, I mean, he certainly saw this coming down the line. Um, I don't know in terms of, uh, you know, Halavai, we had solutions. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I don't, sadly, I don't think he would be surprised. Definitely not. What I would add, though, is that I did hear him talk um, in previous times when anti Semitism was on the rise, particularly on campus. And mm -hmm. when he met with student groups, he would strongly encourage them to make common cause with Muslim students and to have a kind of joint effort to combat anti-Semitism and Islamophobia together. And I think that, you know, that remains the case. And, you know, some attempts in the UK are being made in that way. I think that's a really sort of important direction to pursue. Yeah, I, I think, you know, I, I remember him coming to Washington, D.C. Um, you know, Dan, you spoke about, you know, his distress around the dignity of difference argument. And I guess the only time I had seen him because he had this lightness about him. The only time I saw him 
very, very deeply perplexed and upset was when he talked about the rise of, of, of uh, anti-Semitism in Europe. Um, and he came in almost like with a prophetic voice to sort of tell people, you know, this idea of we dwell alone, um, that the victim should not take, the, it's not up to the victim to, um, to ameliorate the hatred. Um, it's up to the society in which the victim lives. And I think he felt that because he saw himself as a participating as a participating contributor to a more moral society. So when he stuck up for everyone else, right? And it was, he waved the banner around creating a different multicultural society. And how, how was it? I think he was shocked actually. And I shocked, but as, as Dennis is probably not surprised that no one, no one was showing up for us. And um, I, I, I do also think that Israel played a, a, such a deep and central role in his thinking and his being and where he saw his heart. Um, and I, I think that, uh, that he, he, he would be, um, he would be a, a beacon of hope. Uh, he used the term hope all the time. Um, and I think he would remind us to be hopeful and he would remind us that we've been through difficult things and we will go through difficult things again. Um, I think that was, uh, that was part of his, in, in you know, his, his enduring message, um, is that we've, We've been around for a long time and that the scourge of anti-semitism is is not ours to fight alone thank you so much uh, once again for uh, a really enlightening presentation thank you dr brown dr reinhold and dr wright uh, and thanks to all the rabbis who joined us for the for the program um the next session will be at four o'clock with rabbi yona reese on the uh Beit Din Files, inspired by Rabbi Gedalia Dov Schwartz of Blessed Memory. Thank you all. That was outstanding. Thank you. Thanks. Thank so you much. all. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, everyone. It's very Thank much appreciated. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.